I'm going to ask you if you could open your Bibles, please, uh, to Hebrews chapter 13. If you remember, last week we talked about this thing of pastor and, and church leadership, and we want, we want to spend three weeks on sort of dynamics of a church and how a church works or how a church could work. Last week we talked about sort of the pastoral leadership. Today we want to think about uh, this thing. Is, is church membership a thing? What is this thing of church membership? Is it real? Is it not real? How does it work? And all those sorts of things. And we can, we're going to take a little bit uh, a look at the Bible and we'll do a little bit of a survey kind of thing. There's three portions that we will be looking at. Not in any depth, because there's so much there, but, but we want to get a, a, a survey, a, a feeling of what the Scripture seems to be saying. Um, before we kind of dive into that, uh, I, I was doing a little bit of checking, and this whole thing of membership in the clubs, now I'm not saying church is a club, church is a very special kind of organization, I'm not even going to call it a living organization, an organism. Uh, and there's lots of reasons why I say that. We're not going to get into that right now. But I was just looking at clubs across the UK. And there's some unusual ones. You're not going to believe this. Are you ready? Here we go. Here we go. First one I found was the, the Martin Baker Ejection Thai Club. I know. Go figure. So the requirements of joining that club are those who survived being ejected out of an airplane on their Martin Baker ejection seat, okay? Anyone here has joined that club? No. Nobody, okay, well, work on it, and you might be able to join that club. Then there's the Project Steve. Is Steve okay, by the way? I'm not, he's not here today. Yeah, he said he won't come in this week. Okay, that's fine. Maybe he's got something going on. Okay, that's fine. Project Steve Club, and uh, the requirements are that you're a scientist... And your name is? There we go, okay. Who would have thought? Who would have thought? Then we come across the UK Roundabout Appreciation Society. The UK Roundabout Appreciation Society. You can guess. The requirements are that you appreciate the beauty of the UK Roundabouts, especially the one down near Donny College, right? So you're not allowed to curse that one anymore. And lo and behold, you're not going to believe this, and this is particularly for Chad, the president of this society, and I actually even checked it out because I couldn't believe it myself, uh, the president of the society of the UK Roundabout Appreciation Group is called the Lord of the Ring. <laughs> the Lord of the Rings, who would have thought? There we go. And then, and then, last but not least, we all might be able to join this one. This is the Not Terribly Good Club. Right. Yeah. The requirements are you need to find yourself failing at things again and again. Sadly, though, the membership grew so much that they had to shut the group yeah. down because they succeeded and they didn't fulfill their own marching orders. Who would have thought? Who would have thought? So is this thing of church member, now that's a bit daft, I know, but it's real, well, stuff real. What is this thing of church membership? What is this thing? Why do we even think about it? Well, I think a lot of it depends on your view of what church is. Is church something you sort of go to as sort of a drop-in when there's nothing good on the telly? Or is it something that you are part of, that you are connected to how do you see it chad's going to come in just a minute now to read just a few verses from hebrews chapter 13 i wish we had more time to kind of look at the entire thing in sort of more in depth but it's interesting that from verses 1 through 7 of hebrews 13 it talks about believers love for one another and that's a good thing Verses 8 through 16 talked about the focus on Jesus. So there's two major things, what I'm going to call sort of the essentials of Christian life. There's love for one another and then our love for God. Isn't it interesting that someone came to Jesus in Mark chapter 12 and they asked the question. They said, 
Of all the commandments all throughout the Old Testament, which is the greatest of the commandments? Do you know what Jesus said? He said to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, your mind, and your soul, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Well, isn't that interesting that the writer of Hebrews essentially did the exact same thing that Jesus said? Love for each other and our love for God. When it comes down to it, that's what it's all about. If I was to label that chapter 13, that section, that, that, that large section, I would call it the essentials of the Christian life. And there's some biggie verses in there. There's some verses probably that you are aware of that you didn't even know where they were from. For example, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. Most of, if I was to say, where do you find that? Would you be able to tell us Hebrews chapter 13? Probably not. And there are some major, major verses in that particular section. And so I want us to just take a, a, a short bit of time now. We want to look at uh, this particular section in relation to this thing of the church relationship to leaders. Last week we talked about the leaders themselves, but let's think about just for a, little, a short bit here. We're going to kind of divide this up into two major chunks, but the church relationship to leaders first of all i want to look at verse 7 just think about verse 7 there is some debate over what this particular bit may mean because of some of the wording but i think the strongest of support is looking at verse 7 it says remember those who rule over you so and i say i think it's referring to past spiritual leaders you may say, Eric, well, how, what are we talking about? Well, it says, remember those. Okay, well, it could be talking about those from today. It could be. However, those who rule over you, now be careful. We're not we're talking about rule. We're talking about, <clears throat> like last week, we're not talking about tyrants. We're not talking about dictators. We're talking about those who are leaders. Those who are leaders. And it's those, continuing on, those who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith. So the challenge was to follow their faith, considering the outcome of their conduct. The idea is, is that look to them, look to their lives, look to how they even passed away, that they, that they would have died in strength, looking to the Lord. So the church's relationship to leaders, I'd like to suggest in verse 7, deals with those leaders who have gone before those who are standing now as leaders. And that could even point into some of the, you know, the prophets throughout the Old Testament and so forth. So the point is, think of those who led, who were spiritual leaders in the past. But let's look specifically now at what I'm going to call current leaders. Because this massive section through here dealing with the essentials of the Christian life, I find it interesting that the writer talks about the relationship of the church to the leadership. Notice what it says. It says here, starting at verse 17. Obey those who rule over you and be submissive. So what's the difference between obey and be submissive? Let's think about that in just a minute. For they watch out for your souls as those who must give account. And let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable to you. All right, so let's break that apart just a little bit. So first of all, within this whole thing of current leaders, what's going to call, I'm going to call that there's a command, the command to obey, obey. Now be careful, be careful. If this again is not the that the church leadership or me will be asking you to obey in the sense that it be some blind obedience as Hitler, as uh, Stalin commanded obedience just because they were the top dog in their country. The word obedience there means to have confidence in, to have confidence in. And if you don't have confidence in the church leader, then there's something wrong. Either an attitude needs to be adjusted or it's the wrong person up front. And that's possible. That's possible. 
So the command there is, is to have confidence in the church leaders. And because you would have confidence in the next word is to submit, which would be the active part. So the first is sort of the mental view of the leadership. And then there is the active part of submitting to the leaders, <clears throat> so which is a result of the confidence. So that's sort of the first angle. That's the first element. That's the command from the writer of Hebrews from the church body towards the church leadership. Now, I'll, I'll be, I'll be hand, hand on heart, which would, I don't know which one, Bible, heart, you know, something like that. And I'll be honest with you, I have been in churches in the past, I would struggle to do that because I haven't had great respect for the leader. And maybe it was an Eric problem, Maybe it was the leader problem, I don't know. Or a combination, I don't know. But I would say for God to use our CPC, for God to use us, if there's areas that you struggle with me, if it's areas of what I say, teach or what I believe, that sort of thing, how we run church, you think is unbiblical, please come in and approach me. Now, actually, oh, someone's trying to get in. Someone actually came last week and mentioned something. Uh, it wasn't anything sort of doctrinal-wise, but it's sort of my approach to something. And uh, I'm sure it's difficult for this person to, to say something, but you know what? I really appreciate it. I really appreciate it. Number one, because they had the strength and the courage to be able to come up and say something. The reality is, over the years that we've been here, the most, most of the time, what, if something is a problem, people will either run away or they'll bury their head in the sand and pretend that everything will get all better. Okay? So I'm very, very open. Please, I try to be very open that if there's issues. Now, if you say, Eric, I don't like the fact that you're bald. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. The whole, I mean, I could wear two. No, I don't think a toupee would work good on me. Okay? I'm not, and I'm not going to go running to Turkey to get one of those. Hair train. I'm not going to do that, okay? So anyway, we're talking about things that would be sort of of substance here. So the command is to obey and then have confidence and then submit. And then we need to think about then, so okay, what is the purpose? There is, there is, there's a purpose for this. Notice what the Bible says. For they watch out for your souls. Literally, they, the, the word is they stay awake. That's the word. Okay? It means to stay awake. Literally, they stay awake for your souls. And I thought, yeah, <laughs> I see that. I see that. Because, see, you are, you are not people who just show up on a Sunday morning and I have a little list. Oh, Heather's here. Oh, Russell's here. And that's the end of it. Um, we have a relationship. I, I love you. I, I care for you. Uh, I, 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 I hurt when you hurt. Uh, when life is going upside down, I, 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 I walk with you. And the, the, the difficulty is, is that... Um, when there's several whose life is turned upside down and walking along, it, it makes sometimes quite a heavy burden. And when Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, matter of fact, if you just turn there really quickly, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, I, I, want, to I want you to see this because I, I never understood it before doing what I do now. But I, I, I relate in a way, in a way, in a very light way. Wait, can I say that? Okay. One Corin uh, did I say two? 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I hope I got the right one here. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Paul gives, um, starting in verse 22, he gives sort of a list of his, his experiences uh, of his suffering. He talked about, you know, uh, in verse 24, for the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one, 39 stripes. He got beaten five times from the Jews, 39 times. Now, I think I have to remember in, in the law, 
You couldn't go to 40 because that would be deemed as being overly cruel. So they stopped at 40. They stopped one short, 39, okay, if I remember right. He goes on and says, three times I was beaten with rods, verse 25. Once I was stoned. No, it's not modern day stoning. It's throwing of rocks. Three times I was shipwrecked. A day and a night I'd been in the deep. On and on and on and on. And weariness, verse 27, weariness and toil and sleeplessness and hunger and thirst, fastings and uh, fastings often and cold and nakedness. Wow. You would have, Paul, you would have thought Paul would have said, forget this. I'd rather go back to making tents and make, make a bit of dosh. Why should I deal with all this? But then Paul continues on in verse 28. Beside the other things, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. See, Paul was a church starter. He went from place to place to place and started all these churches. And, and, uh, and each time he would go, he, you know, they deal with issues and, and get people, as, as people were learning, he would establish leadership and so forth. But he always had that connection with all these churches. He said, of all these physical things, of all these beatings and all the stuff that I experienced, he said, on top of all that, I carry around the daily burden of all the church. Now, be careful. Don't think when I say the word burden of a heavy uh, chain tied to your leg with a big ball and you're on the wrecking crew there on the on the prison line beating those rocks it's not that kind of a burden but the reality is he knew that believers in those churches were suffering he knew that the believe in those, those churches were being beaten possibly by the, by, 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 by the Romans and suffering persecution from the Jews and all kinds of things. The reality is, Paul just said that with all, everything else that is going on, he said, I experience struggles. I have burdens for the believers in those churches. So the command from the writer in Hebrews to the believers is said, listen, obey and submit. Why? Because those church leaders stay awake, worrying, thinking, praying, concerned for your souls, concerned for the things that you are concerned about. But then he goes on, gives us another little insight. He said, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give account. And let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. So the goal of, of, the, of the leaders doing what they do and, uh, and then the, the, the watch care over the souls of, 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 of the people within the church, they desire to be able to answer to the Lord, how? Joyfully. Joyfully. Have you ever come across, uh, a, you come across a friend, maybe not seen for a long time, or a family member, and the first question you often ask is, hey, how's the family doing, right? And, oh, uh, oh, uh, I, uh, Doreen's the person, not you, another Doreen. Uh, Doreen's doing fantastic. I mean, she's got a job and she's working and she's, she, you know, there's two little kids now. And da, 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 da. Oh, what about Callum? Oh. Yeah, Callum's still struggling. Got an addiction to porn and his wife is going to leave him. And uh, That's what it's talking about. That's what it's talking about. The writer's saying, listen, this church leadership, you need to obey and be submissive because they look out for your souls because they will have to give account to God for how they led the church. And please be of the sort so that they could be able to answer the Lord. How? Joyfully. Well, Doreen's doing fantastic and, and she's, she's, she's faithful. And yes, she's, she's facing difficulties and Doreen is our little energizer bunny and she just sticks, sticks another battery in her. She just kind of keeps going on forever and a day. And, and uh, you know, that's, that's joyful. That's joyful. And that's what the reader, I believe, is talking about. 
And so as he goes on and continues on, it's interesting that the writer then send, finishes up this section and says, pray for us. So he wraps all those things in the request to pray for them. But now I want us to think just for a little bit, to go beyond the, this thing of the, the church's relationship to the leaders to that of what we're going to call the church's relationship among themselves. Now, this is a bit more challenging bit. I'm going to ask you to hang tight with me. Turn, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. <clears throat> now, we have mentioned this sometimes when we come to communion, but let's look at it a little bit more in depth for just a few minutes. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, starting in verse 1. Let's read a few verses. The Bible says this. It says, It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, that is, among those attending the church in Corinth. Sexual immorality. And such sexual immorality that it's not even named among the Gentiles. Okay? That would be sort of the unbelievers. That a man has his father's wife. So a bloke is sleeping with, probably not his mother. Who knows? Maybe. <laughs> maybe it's someone else that his father married. Anyway, pretty bad stuff happening sexually within the church. But then he goes on, verse 2. And you're puffed up. You're arrogant. And have not rather mourned. He said... You're saying, well done. Hello? And have not done this deed might be, and, and, and he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. Now, wait a minute, that's interesting. That's interesting. For I indeed, as absent in body, but present in spirit, have already judged as though I were present him who has so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together along with my spirit and the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such an one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. Your glorying is not good. Do, not, do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? We'll get to that in just a minute. Therefore, purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump since you are truly, since, uh, you truly are unleavened, for indeed Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. That very, very famous passage. The church relationship among ourselves. Now we're getting to this church membership thing. Yep, just hang tight. So there is some sin within the church. Here's the problem. The problem was some sexual immorality within the church. And the, that Paul would have said, listen, you should have, there is, it seems that in verse 2, that there is a removal of that person from the church, from the, from the congregation. You may say, Eric, hold on now. I thought church is for everybody. Absolutely. Church is for everybody. Okay? And I, I think I have always said that everybody is welcome. Everybody's welcome. Um, only if there's not a problem being caused, then we, then that's another category. Okay. So if you, people are willing to come and to listen and to, and to, 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 to join in and to question things, that's fine. As long as there's not issues being, there's not, um, problems being generated by that person and they're refusing. And we're going to come to that in just a second. Okay. So. There seems to be, in that particular passage, notice what it says, let's go back up to it, looking at verse 2. And you're puffed up. You are arrogant. You're proud almost that this kind of activity is happening within the church. Now, I'm not saying the church building, but it's happening amongst the members. You're arrogant about it. You're almost proud about it, but you should have mourned. You should have been sad. You should have been, dis you should have been bothered that these kind of things were happening. Verse 2. 
that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. So there seems to be within the church a requirement for a level of accountability, a level of responsibility, and the church members and with, with the leadership to, to take it upon themselves because if we are called, and we are called, the, the word is, we're not talked about it much, the bride of Christ. There's a word for that. There's a label for that. That we are, we are, we are, we are joined together in Christ and through Christ, but it seems that there is some areas of sin. Now, I'm not saying that every person who comes here must be perfect, okay? Now, there's lots of debate on, so, Eric, if you're talking about removing someone, that, does that mean if I, I don't know, that I got angry at the television last week on Thursday, that I should, no, okay? We're more talking about things like, and there again, this becomes a bit of a gray area, things of public sin, things that if people would look at RCBC and word gets out that this particular person is sleeping with this other person, eh, is that what church is all about? It's just willy-nilly, do what you want. And you, and I, I thought God was this, you know. Why? Why? Notice what it says. Verse 2, this thing of removal. Then it says, talks about, now we can get into, I'm not sure exactly what, 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 what Paul's talking about here. Verse 5 says that the removal of this person to deliver such an one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. I think Paul is simply saying, listen, you need to deal with these sort of things. You need to deal with these sort of things that God can deal with the fleshy bit, the sinful bit. But I would say that Paul is saying, and we're not saying that he lost his salvation, he's lost his forgiveness, but God needs to deal with the sin. But then goes on, this says this. Do you not know, in verse 6, that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? What is leaven? That's an old Bible word. What does that mean? It's yeast, okay? What is yeast? Okay, so yeast is the stuff, if you're making a loaf of bread, and Chad's becoming quite the bread maker, uh, you take uh, the, you know, the flour and the whatever, and you mix it together, and you, some of that, what you mix together is yeast and what does yeast do uh, it makes the bread dough rise it affects the entire loaf so that wouldn't it be a strange thing if you put this this, this yeast you throw it in a clump and then whoop but everything else was like that that wouldn't be very nice right pretty nasty bread so this yeast is meant to be mixed throughout all the mixture so that the entire loaf rises and tastes delish that's the whole point so Paul's taking that illustration of leaven or yeast and saying, listen, if you have some yeast and put it into bread, you're gonna, it's going to mix throughout the whole bread and all of it's going to rise in the same way. There's an impact if there's sin within the church, particularly of this type that Paul's talking about. It doesn't just impact that person and the person who they're dealing with. It impacts everybody. I'm not saying we don't need to be loving. We do need to be loving. But there's also a level of responsibility and accountability. Holding that thought, let's quickly turn up to Matthew chapter 18 now. Sin in the church, but then let's more, even more focus on sin amongst members in a larger kind of way. Matthew chapter 18, a relatively well-known passage. Now, some of you may get upset with something I'm going to say here, but that's okay. It's happened before. Matthew chapter 18, let's read verse 15. On reading a few verses. Notice what the Bible says. It says, moreover, if your brother sins against you, if your brother or sister does something against you, okay? Uh, Janice gets angry one day and she punches Allison, right? 
And I'm not saying it's going to happen. I'm not speaking a word of prophecy or anything. I'm not dang, saying that. Let's just pretend that this would happen, okay? Uh, you go and tell him his fault. So it's Allison's job to go up to, uh, to, to Janice and say, Jan, Janice, you knocked my lights out. I thought you were a believer. What's going off here? That's what it says. In the first instance, Allison is meant to go to Janice and tell him his or her fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, not with just these, but with your heart, if he hears you, you have gained your brother or your sister. So problem sorted. Wouldn't that be nice if every time we had a problem, we go up to the person, you talk it out, and it is sorted. Wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't that be nice? But we all know that doesn't always happen. Verse 16, but if he will not hear you, take with you one or two other, one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. So, Allison goes to Janice. Janice says, what are you talking about? I don't know what you're talking about. Allison said, well, Chris and Pat saw it. So she rings up Chris and Pat. Chris and Pat, listen, this thing happened. Can you go with me and have a word with Janice? Okay. Verse 17, and if she refuses to hear them, oh, Janice is being stubborn. She says, I'm not even taking you lot on board. If he or she refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. There again seems to be a relationship of both responsibility and accountability within this situation now you're going to say eric this is unfair this is mean-spirited what does it say if he or she refuses even to hear the church let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector there seems to be that if there's a refusal to listen even to your church brothers and sisters and you say okay we are a family we are accountable and responsible to each other. And if you're not going to be humble, even though Pat and Chris saw what Janus did, then we can't fellowship together anymore. And it seems to be that to be the case. Is it easy? No. Is it nice? No. Is it necessary? Yes. Verse 18, I surely I say to you that whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. It seems that the decisions you are making here, that as you go through this procedure, God is saying, this is the procedure that I have set up. And then, and again I say to you, if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. Here's where you're going to get upset with me. You ready? So hold, hold tight. Put your seatbelt on. Typically, this verse gets quoted when there's only one or two at a prayer meeting or there's one or two at Bible study. You say, ah, well, the Bible says where two or three are gathered, there am I in the midst of them, right? That's what we do. Now, wait a minute. That's a bit discouraging, actually. Does that mean if I'm by myself that God's not with me? No. I'd like to suggest that within the context that when the Bible says that there am I in the two or three, what's the two or three? The two or three are the two that would go to the person with the challenge of what they've done. And even the larger, the church would approach the person. And so I think what God is saying is that in those situations that I am there amongst you to support you, I am there to be with you as this very difficult decision happens. Now let me say this, that the desire is for fellowship to be restored. The desire is for Janice to say, I'm sorry, Allison, I shouldn't have cleaned your clock the other day. Okay, and I promise never to do it again. Yes, sir. No, that's good. I'm glad. Oh, that's good. 
So, so we, didn't, we didn't have to go through these last five or six minutes, okay? But the idea is, and all this stuff is for believers to be restored. That is the desire. That's the desire. But God has set out these things amongst the church community so that the church continues to remain pure, as pure as possible, to be able to glorify Him, to reflect who He is. So, how then, how then does how then does this relate to church membership? Let me give you two or three bits, and I'll kind of wind up with what we're doing here. There's a definite relationship, responsibility, and accountability amongst a local group of believers and leadership. Let me say that again. Biblically, there is a definite relationship, responsibility, and accountability amongst local group of believers and leadership. That as we've gone through those two or three areas in the Bible, seems to be clear. Truth number two. To be removed from something means that, I guess, logically, that someone would have to be first part of something, right? Does that make sense? Right? So you have a, you have a bowl of, I don't know, hairy bow, uh, that's hairy bow are all living together nicely in this bowl. If you were to remove a hairy bow, first of all, that hairy bow had to be inside the bowl to start with, right? Okay, it makes sense. Makes sense. However, biblically speaking, I have not found anything of the particulars on what it means to be a church member. Now, if you if you to go to all the churches around the world, say even Christian churches, you have procedures from A to Z. I mean, you'll have all kinds of things. And I think what this means is that God leaves it up to the local church to say, okay, there seems to be a thing of a church membership. There seems to be a thing of a more than just of a drop-in kind of scenario, come when you want to. There seems to be a, a connection of some sort. And it's up to you to decide what that looks like within your context. Okay. Now, we do have a legal responsibility, for example, to the government, to the charities commission, that we have what's called trustees. Okay. Currently, we're not doing a good job of that uh, because we don't have the right number of trustees, and we want to look at to be sorting this out in the very near future. And being a trustee from our, and we do have a constitution, by the way. You may not know that, but we do have a church constitution. You're very welcome to look at it. And it's about yay thick. And if you're, if you're troubled getting to sleep one night, all you have to do is open that thing up and bang, you'll go to sleep straight away. Okay? More importantly, I'm going to say that's not less, it's not unimportant, but more importantly, we, we have what I would call a church membership agreement. Okay? Anyone who wants to be a, a member of RCBC, we have some very, very simple requirements. Requirement number one is that you have received Jesus as your Savior. You must be a Christian to have a membership here at RCBC. Number two, that you would need to have been baptized since you became a believer. Okay? Now, there may be some uh, circumstances that would, might, be, might struggle with that, if, if the answer is, well, I just don't want to because I was already christened as a baby, then we got a, something to kind of work through, okay? So it's relatively simple, and that you would agree to the following. Let me just read you, and then we're going to finish up with this. This is directly from our church membership uh, agreement, and sort of there's the church's responsibility to you, and then your responsibility to the church. Let me read it to you. It says this. I believe that God is leading me to be joined in fellowship with the followers of Christ at RCBC. Having accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior and baptized by immersion through God's help and strength, I promise to stand alongside the members of RCBC too, and there's five bits. Number one, I promise to, number one, grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus through discipleship and to apply what God is teaching me so that I can be a blessing an example to others. Number two, I promise to support my brothers and sisters in Christ through fellowship together. Number three, 
I promise to engage with the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and worship through personal and corporate. Corporate means together. Worship with RCBC. Number four. To do my best to support the work of, that the Lord has given RCBC in reaching non-Christians through evangelism. Now be careful. I've had loads of conversations. That doesn't mean that everyone's going to go out on the street corner. Rah, 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 that sort of thing. I was talking with someone not too long ago, and this person has just a natural way of te- speaking with people. And they just, he, he, they just talk to people uh, about the Lord as it comes along in work. That's evangelism. Okay? Don't feel like you have to have a badge on. You go knock on someone's door. Okay? Don't feel like that. It's a natural way of just telling people about who Jesus is in whatever context you have. Number five. Serve my community and brothers and sisters in Christ according to my gifting. Okay? So, I wanted to just take today to spend just a bit of time thinking about this thing of is church membership a thing? Now, there's churches that don't have a membership, and that's fine. There's no command that I see. No command that I see. There does seem to be a something that's more than just a casual drop-in. Because, like I said, if you remove someone, there needs to be a way for that person to join in. I can also say that everyone is welcome to be here. You don't have to be a member. But if you want to be a trustee, we're going to be talking about something called an elder next week. If you want to be an elder, then certainly you would need to be a member. If you desire to be the pastor, you would need to be a member okay so okay so and and i would say that also if you have any desire to be a to have spiritual leadership you would need to be a member if someone wants to do coffees and teas perfectly fine perfectly fine okay you may say eric well that's not the way it was in my church back in mm, give me a town Uh, where in workshop barnsley london i don't care okay fine 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 I, I get it, I get it. And I'm not saying we are just like everybody else or everyone else is just like us. And, we're, and, um, and so we're just looking for the best way without a whole lot of machinery that God can use us and help us to be organized and as effective as possible.